working with what we call today open source code. I was trained as half electrical engineer and half business person. And back in those days, there was no such thing as a computer science degree. But I did study on how to program computers. I've worked with Linux since 1994 when I met Linus Torvalds for the first time. And I've been a programmer and a systems administrator. But most importantly for this talk today, I have taught at the university level. I understand what a university is supposed to be doing. And I've also been a business person. I know what businesses need. And finally, I am very pragmatic. Some people say that free software is a religion. But I am not religious. I do believe in God, but I don't believe that he necessarily does programming or she. And uh, so I'm a pragmatic person. I'd like to introduce to you to a few of my friends that I've known over the years. The person in the upper right-hand corner, his name is Eric Troen. He is an English history major, but he did know how to do programming. He is also one of the three people who started a company called Red Hat Software. At the age of 22, he became a multi-millionaire. The next person I'd like to introduce is the person right there. His name is Mark Spencer. At the age of 19, he wanted to start a company to do software support. But he needed a very expensive piece of equipment called a PBX, a private branch exchange. It's like a telephone switchboard. And they cost 30,000 US dollars. He did not have the money for that. So instead, he wrote a piece of software called Asterisk which duplicates what a PBX does. He formed a company called Digium that now, that now employs 350 people and thousands more around the world make their living by installing asterisk systems. He is a multi-millionaire. The person right there is not a multi-millionaire, but he started programming at the age of nine he was hacking the Linux kernel at the age of 12. He was writing device drivers at the age of 15. At the age of 19, he went to work for a small university as a systems administrator. And at the age of 21, he was helping the Federal Bureau of Investigation capture people breaking into computer systems over the internet. Today, he is happily married and he's working at the University of Washington doing advanced research in new I.O. devices and visual aid devices. Did I mention he never graduated from high school? The person in the lower right-hand corner developed his own distribution of Linux at the age of 14. It was the first distribution of Linux to install into the FAT file system so that you did not have to repartition your disk. He had sold 20,000 copies of it before his parents found out what he was doing. And when they said to him, why didn't you tell us you were doing this? He said, I didn't really need your help. This person lives in Soweto, South Africa. Soweto is a very poor black town in South Africa just north of Johannesburg. There are 500,000 people who live in Soweto. The government of South Africa did not believe that anybody in Soweto knew anything about computers. But then they found this man, who was running a consulting service out of his house using dial-up networking and also communicating with Linus Torvalds via email, helping Linus debug a problem in the memory management subsystem of the Linux kernel. And this so surprised the government of South Africa that they opened up 
an open source development center in Soweto. And finally, this person right here, I first met him two years ago. At the age of 12 and a half, he had created his own Linux distribution. At the age of 16, he now has a company that sells support for 20,000 people using his distribution in 15 countries around the world. I met him at Campus Party Spain. The reason I'm showing you these people is that none of them received their computer training through a typical university environment. Even though Eric had his degree from a university, it was not in computer science. All of them learned what they needed to know about programming by studying the code that others had done before them, and they could do that because of free and open source. So we have to ask ourselves what the real goals of a university are. A university, believe it or not, is not out there to train you to do a job. That is not the goal of a university. The goal of a university is to create a thinking populace, a thinking electorate, the people who are going to be running the country in the next generation of people. The university is there to educate a workforce, the people who are going to help industry create the next generation of technology so that the country can move forward. The university is there to do research, to be able to develop new things so that industry and the society can benefit from it. And so the university is funded with public money from taxes to be able to do this, and also private money from industry to do this. The university has nothing to do with getting you a job. That's your job, not the university's. Why do we do this? Why is the university and software Libre important to this country, to Colombia? First of all, it's going to be creating local jobs. Every time you buy something from a country outside of Colombia, that's money that leaves Colombia that could be paying somebody to do that job. You want to have a local job because if people can't find good work inside of your own country, they will leave and go some other place. And the money that your university spent in training them now goes to that other country. This is what we call a brain drain. Also, you, be, you need to be able to create an attraction for industry to come into your country to employ more people. If there are not enough trained engineers, scientists, programmers, teachers, and other things, those countries, those companies will not come to your country. Another thing that's important is the security of your country. The economic security. The balance of trade, which I mentioned before. Now, in Latin America, there's a lot of software piracy. In Brazil, for example, 84% of the software is pirated in a desktop. This actually degrades your value as a programmer. Because if people say, I can steal software, then they'll say, they'll continue to do that. And when you want to charge them for this work that you do, they'll say, why should I pay you when I could just steal it from somebody else? On the other hand, when you pay for software and that money goes outside of your economy, it is less money that could be paid to you as a local software programmer. There's another issue, and that is something called embargo. Now, I live in the United States, and there's a small country off the coast of Florida. You may have heard of it. It's called Cuba. And we have had an economic embargo against Cuba for 40 years, 
so long that most of us have forgotten why we even have it. This means that Cuba cannot directly go to Microsoft, as an example, and buy software from them, because that's illegal. And Fidel Castro cannot call up Bill Gates and ask for a fix to a software problem. This retards the economy of Cuba and is something that you need to think about. Now, I'm glad that the United States has a good relationship with Colombia. And I hope that our relationship continues forever. But you, as a sovereign country, cannot depend on that. Software is no longer a luxury. We cannot go back to running the country with slide rules and hand calculators. You need to be able to produce the software in your country to keep it going. It's also to build up this local expertise to attract outside industry to Colombia. If the, again, if the companies do not see the expertise, they will not come. Your military has to put software into your planes, into your tanks, into your ships. How do they know that the software that they get in binary only form does not have a Trojan horse in it or a trap door that would prevent the software from doing what it's supposed to in time of need. With free software, they can look at every single part of it and determine that the software is adequate for its job. And finally, there's a concept of longevity. How long should you be able to read your documents? How long should you be able to run your elevators? With closed source software, if a company goes out of business, you may lose the ability to get updates to that software. But with free software, you have the source code for it, and you can always maintain it yourself in times of economic stress. So now let's go to the four functions of education. The first function of education, and particularly in a university, is to create a path of educating the student. The student comes out of their high school, they start to go to the university, and the university says, we know the courses that they need to be successful in whatever they're doing. Now, I know a lot of you are university students, and you may think you'll never need all of these courses that the professors are asking you to do. I can tell you, you may not need every single one, but sooner or later, you'll probably need most of them. And by the time you need it, it's too late to learn the information. The way this path is created is that the university talks to industry and government about the things that are necessary. They talk to other universities around the world to see the things which are necessary to create the type of person that you want to be. And then they create, put this into what they call the curriculum. You can go and see what that curriculum requires. You can look at their website and see what you need to study to become a computer engineer or a biologist. Now, this list, this path, is not created as a democracy. Companies go to the university and say, we think that they should be trained in this. It doesn't automatically happen. It's more of a republic type of thing, where the university professors listen to the input but then use their own expertise to, to define the final path. Secondly, is to teach to those objectives. So once the objectives are determined, the university professors go in and teach the subjects that need to be taught. After that, they certify that the student has actually learned the information. That's testing. 
And finally, of course, you're given a diploma which tells the world that you have gone through, studied these courses, and you actually know the information. In addition to that, the university does research on new topics to lead the world forward. Now let's take a look at your total education from the time you were born. Your first education, of course, is with your family. You start to learn things in, in working with the different members of your family. But then you may go to a nursery school or a kindergarten where you start to learn things like how to interact with other people that are no longer in your family. You start to learn things about schedule, that things have to be done at certain times. You go to grade school and you're taught how to read and write and do arithmetic and start to do arts and sciences. You go into high school, you learn more about sciences and humanities. And it's, in all of these places, what you're doing is the teacher goes into the class and says, okay, we're gonna study this today. Open up your book to this page, read along with us, study this information. If it doesn't come out of the mouth of the teacher, it doesn't show up on the test. This is what happens during high school. But now, we go, now we go to university. And the very first thing that'll happen in the university is the professor will say to you something like this. I do not have the time to teach you everything you need to know. I'm only going to point. It's up to you to go to the library and read books. It's up to you to go to the internet and search for things. It's up to you to interview people and ask some questions and learn. What they're trying to teach you is how to learn on your own. Because once you've learned that, then you've been taught for the rest of your life. It's just like the old parable, if you give a person a fish, you feed them for a day. If you teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. And so the university is really there to teach you how to learn and how to think. When you go for your master's degree, it's teaching you how to solve a problem. Because during your master's degree, you typically have a master's thesis where you have to find a problem, define it, and solve it. And then in your PhD, it is the culmination of all of this. It is the ability to solve a problem that's never been solved before and to actually prove that it's new knowledge. And this is the path of education. Notice I didn't say one single time that they're teaching you how to use Microsoft Office. I didn't say one single time that they're teaching you how to do Cisco networking. And also, particularly in the United States these days, there's a lot of talk about teaching the humanities and, teach, and the fact that technology is overcoming the human part of us. This should not be taught in schools. You can teach philosophy, that's true. But the only place that humanity should be taught is in the home and in the church. Because humanity is a very tricky thing to teach. And you want to know that it's being done right in the home and in the church. So let's take a look at alternate methods of university instruction. I took what was known as cooperative education. I would go to school for six months and I would work in industry for six months. I would go back to school in university for six months and I would work in industry for six months. 
And by doing this, I not only got the instruction from the professors, but I also got to see and experience in real life what the engineers were doing. And it was actually because of this that I decided not to be an electrical engineer. I decided to go into this new thing called software and computer science because I found out that by pure logic, I could solve problems. I didn't even need a computer. I could simply think it through. And this fascinated me a lot like it fascinated Alan Turing. So cooperative education is a good way to get an education from a university because not only do you see in real life what you're actually be doing, but you can make money which helps you to fund your education at the university. Another path is what we call the Guild Program. This has been in place for hundreds of years in England and is made up of three basic paths or, or three basic stages, the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master. A master craftsman would bring in an apprentice, somebody who wanted to learn the trade or learn the, how to do it, and the master craftsman would pay them a little bit of money to help them do things that needed to be done. The apprentice would watch the master craftsman doing their job, and eventually they would learn enough that they could leave and become what is known as a journeyman, to go around and practice their craft until such time as they got to be good enough to be considered a master craftsman. Now, this was typically for trades like plumbing or electrical work or things like that, but recently in England, they've actually started up an apprenticeship program for systems administration. So that a young apprentice systems administrator would work with a master or senior systems administrator, learning to craft and eventually move up to become a master systems administrator themselves. And the advantage of this program is you can start off somebody who has very little knowledge and they can earn money to support themselves while they're following this path. The person that hires them gets somebody who is enthusiastic and a good worker and eventually ends up with a trained person. Mentorship is a program where you go out and you have a senior person who takes an interest in somebody learning the craft and mentors them. They don't employ them necessarily, but they answer their questions and they help them move forward. And eventually, they may even give them a letter of recommendation when they want to go out and get a, and get a job. And finally, there's self-learning. I, the first program I ever wrote, I learned to write that program by reading a book. I did not have anybody who taught me computer science. I read a book called How to Program the IBM 1130 Computer in Fortran. And I read the book. I practiced punching the paper cards, putting them in the computer, and running it. And when it didn't work, I would go back, figure out why it didn't work, and try again. In fact, I have never had anybody teach me a course in programming languages. I've always learned them on my own, just like the people I showed you learned on their own. And you could do that. There's you know, all this code out there, which you'll see later on, that you can look at and see how the software works. So today, what a lot of universities are teaching, very unfortunately, is they're teaching things like Cisco networking, 
or Microsoft Office. They're teaching how to use a product. And the problem with that is when the product changes, in effect, part of your education disappears. Or if the company goes out of business, part of your education disappears. A few years ago, people were teaching Nortel networking because Nortel was the second largest telephone company on the face of the earth. But because of poor management, Nortel went bankrupt in only two years. And so people who have been studying how to do Nortel networking all of a sudden found out that their education was worthless because there was no more Nortel and no more Nortel networking. Now people say to me, Mad Dog, this is why I only get my software and my training in really large companies like Microsoft or like Cisco. But unfortunately, I've been in the business for 42 years and I've seen a lot of companies that at one time were the second largest company in the face of the earth, disappear, including the company that I worked for, Digital Equipment Corporation. And even when companies do not disappear, they stop with product lines, or they sell off a division, and that they no longer have that product that you spent time learning. And this is why you should not be learning a product. You should be learning the fundamentals of why that product works. And then you can apply that for the rest of your life. So what is free culture and how can it help you in this path? Well, most of you are used to free and open source software. We talk about it a lot here at Campus Party. You may not be as much aware of free and open standards. Standards are what allows the software to work together even though it comes from different places and different companies. And there are people who work very hard to create these standards and to publish them so that people can write their software to these standards. Standards also exist for hardware. And standards exist even for things like law. So the development of these standards is very important. And it's important that it be done in a free and open fashion so that everybody has input to it. And there isn't one or two companies that control it and move it only in the direction that they want it to go. There's something called Creative Commons, which is a way of licensing digital technology, where you can freely license your text, your music, your photographs. You maintain control because you were the creator of this. Now, this is where I differ from, from, from some free software people. Some free software people say there's no such thing as copyright. There's no such thing as intellectual property. I believe this is wrong. I believe that if you have an idea, that you should have the right to say what happens to that idea. And this is what copyright gives you, the control over your idea. Now, as a free and open source person, I encourage you to license that idea freely so that other people can build upon it and make it better. But that's your decision, not mine. And so Creative Commons gives you a way of licensing that in an easy fashion to give people the ability to use your idea but also give you control of it. And finally, a new field is free and open hardware. Now, I know a lot of you have phones out there that might use the Android operating system. 
and the Android operating system does publish the source code for the operating system. But unfortunately, most of the hardware that you put Android on is closed. You can't see how to program it, and that's a bad thing. Open hardware allows you to see exactly how to program the hardware so that you can maintain the hardware and the software for it indefinitely. And truly open hardware allows you to extend the hardware to make it better so that people keep making it better and better and giving it more and more capabilities. Now, there was a very famous physicist many years ago, Sir Isaac Newton. You may remember him. He first discovered gravity or noticed gravity with the apple falling out of the tree. And he said that if I have been so good, if I've been such a great physicist, it's because there were lots of other people who came before me and I have stood on their shoulders and I've improved what they've seen. And this is what we do with free and open source culture. So with software Libra, a lot of people think it's really great because you can get it for free. You can pull it down off the internet. And certainly that's true. But the greatest thing about it is the freedom it gives you to extend it, to see how it works, and to make it have that lifetime of longevity. Now, a lot of people say to me, Mad Dog, Linux is really hard to use. That's why everybody uses Windows. But I have seen people using Linux at the age of three years old. People that are so young, they don't even know how to read yet. But they can use the mouse to control Linux to launch their games. It's not hard to use. It's just different. And today, we have lots of people who are using the internet even before they go to elementary school. So they're beginning to get used to technology at very, very early ages. And we have things, projects like the One Laptop Per Child project of giving a laptop to students at age seven so they can start to get used to it and learn through the access to the internet. Now, this is all wonderful because everybody loves a child. Cute little children, smiling, cute little children. I love children too. Typically cooked well, okay? No, I'm just kidding. I love children. But I'm also concerned about older people who maybe need to be retrained to get a job to get off of welfare and become taxpayers. Now, in free software, we have a lot of very interesting projects that can help. LTSP is the Linux Terminal Server project. And here, you use a server system, or maybe two servers, so that if one fails, the other one takes over. And then you have thin clients on every student's desk. And like the uh, group of people before me who were talking about trying to recycle computers and trying to uh, cut down on the amount of, of waste computers and things like that, LTSP can be used to do that recycling program. And the other nice thing about LTSP is it makes it very easy to administer the computer system for a school. In Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, there's a school system that has uh, 4,400 students and 2,200 desktop computers. They use 31 server systems to be able to control this, and they only have four systems administrators. So that's a huge number of students to only have four people supporting their computing systems. But more importantly, in Curitiba, Brazil, there was a small high school. 
and the small high school had no money for a computer system. So the teacher went to a bank, and the bank was, having, was upgrading all of their desktop computers, and the teacher said, please, give us your old computers, and we'll take them to our school. They took them, and they took all the computers apart and put all of the components on shelves. And then the teacher had the students take the components and reconfigure the computers to maybe you put more memory into them or more disks. And they created a whole laboratory for the students at zero cost to the taxpayers. Now, there were two good things that came of this. Number one, the students had a laboratory where they could do their work. But number two, they learned so much more than if somebody had just bought them the computers because they learned how to reconfigure the computers. They learned how to put them together. They learned how to install the software. And more importantly, they learned what pride it was to solve their own problem. Here's another solution for people. Linux and BSD systems can now be installed on a flash drive, a USB flash drive. And USB flash drives are now so big that not only can you install the Linux system on it, but you can have a lot of space left over for the files of the person. So let's say you have a 32 gigabyte flash. Linux operating system might use up four gigabytes of that and leave 28 gigabytes left over for the student's files. The students can now take this, plug it into almost any computer, boot up Linux, connect to the internet, do their work, store the data back on the USB flash drive, pull out the USB, reboot the computer back to what it was doing before. They can take their files home, work on their files at home, and bring them back to the school. They can hang it around their neck so they won't lose it. And all for the cost of a USB flash drive. You might also go to some company and say, you can print your advertising or your logo on the outside of the USB, but just buy the USB for us so we can give them to our students. A very low cost solution. And not only that, but because you don't have any licensing royalties to pay, you don't have to worry about paying for the software that goes on the USB. There are several distributions that are specifically sure. There are several distributions that are specifically for the grade school people. One is called K-12 Linux, which is a combination of LTSP, which we mentioned before, and the Fedora operating system. It has a series of different programs that are useful to elementary school students to have them learn different subjects. There's also a distribution that was created in Extremadura, Spain, called GNU Linux. This is used by 500,000 students in Spain. It's in Spanish, and it has a lot of additional programs for use in education. There is a distribution that is created in Brazil called Poseidon Linux, which is specifically oriented towards scientific work. It has programs on there for geographical information science, visualization of data, manipulation of mathematics, statistics, genetics, and other research projects, and is available in a multitude of different languages. All you have to do is go to the website and pull it down and install it. Let's take a look at university courses in computer science 
and how could free and open source help with that? If you're trying to teach operating systems design, you can have a large number of different operating systems to show your students how they work. It's not just Linux. It's also BSD, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD. They do things a different way, but you can look at the source code for them and see how they do it and see how it works. There's also an operating system called FreeDOS. It's a simple DOS operating system just like Windows DOS, but all of the source code is available for it and it is binary compatible with Windows DOS. TinyOS is an operating system that's used for embedded systems and it's very, very small. There's also two microkernels. One is CMU Mach and the other is the Herd from the Free Software Foundation. So if you're trying to teach your students how an operating system works, you have a wide range of different programs that you could show them. Now these are not simple toy operating systems. They're very sophisticated. You're familiar with Linux and the fact it's used on the top 500 fastest computers in the world as well as on phones and other things. But these are multi-user, multitasking, multi-threaded, multi-architecture operating systems. The Linux is available in 32-bit or 64-bit. Why is that important? Because with 32 bits, you can access 4 billion bytes of data at one time. But with 64 bits, you can access 4 billion times 4 billion bytes of data. And that's enough data to store 128 bytes of data for every square millimeter on the surface of the Earth and all the oceans combined. In other words, a problem which is probably smaller than the one you're trying to solve. In addition to the kernel itself, Linux and BSD operating systems support a wide range of different file systems, including a networked file system called NFS and another one called Samba. Linux systems can act as a server for Windows and Apple systems. Almost every type of networking protocol ever invented has been supported by Linux. If you're interested in security, there's three different security models that are supported by the operating systems. Kerberos, which is a network security system, SE Linux, and AppArmor. And you can look at the different methods they have of doing security. If you're interested in graphics, they support OpenGL and a client-based Windows system called the X Windows system. If you're interested in high performance computing or high availability computing, that is also done with these systems. If you're interested in virtualization, if you're interested in emulators, all of this is available in source code. But computer science is more than just the operating system itself. Almost every single language ever invented is supported by free and open source. The only existing full implementation of the Ada language is an open source project. All the interpreters used in designing things on the web are free and open source. Database engines like MySQL and Postgres are open source. Flat file systems or flat databases like CouchDB, also open source. If you want to study any of these things and how they work, you can get the open source code and see it for yourself. And if you go out to SourceForge out on the internet, 
you'll find out that there's over 430,000 different projects by 3.4 million different developers. And the source code is there for you to look at, for you to study, and for you to learn how it's done. And this is all without countries like China and India and all of Latin America being fully on board the open source development platform. As they come on, these numbers will only grow. What type of some programs are out there? Are you interested in music? There's all sorts of audio programs. Are you interested in multimedia? All sorts of visual uh, video editors are out there. Are you interested in business? ERP systems. Are you interested in security or science and engineering? Almost anything you're interested in, there are programs out there that you can study or you can improve. And you, can, you don't have to use all of the program. You can use parts of them. It saves you from having to start from scratch every time you want to build something. If you're doing a new project and you need a database, you can use MySQL or Postgres or CouchDB or one of the others. You don't have to start from scratch with everything. And when you go out to some place like SourceForge, you meet other people who have the same interests that you do. They may have even more experience than you do, more expertise. You can ask questions of them. There are mailing lists out there where they've had technical discussions about why you should be doing something in one way versus another. The information is there for you to get. And this allows your research to go faster because you can simply go and scan this information which has already been written. So we now have a new model of developing software for the future that's actually the old model that I experienced in 1969. Because the software source code is available for you to look at. And the people that are writing it are available for you to talk to. And so what we should be doing is learning the service of creating software. The service of helping people make the software meet their needs better. The service in training people how to use that software. And in the worst case, you'll only pay for that software one time. In the best case, you'll never have to pay for it. And a lot of people are afraid of the word service because they think of service like cooking hamburgers. But this service is much more like being a brain surgeon. A brain surgeon does not create a product. You do not end up with a second brain when they get finished. They repair the brain you've got. And yet you won't go out there and say, I'm looking for a cheap brain surgeon. You won't look for the advertisement that says, I do brain surgery cheap. I use last year's x-ray machine. I don't wash my hands in between brain surgeries. Because your brain is very important to you. And likewise to a business person, their business is important to them. They want somebody who is good. I was recently talking with a friend of mine. He was charging a thousand US dollars a day for doing security consulting. And he said, I've got so much work, I don't have any time to do any of the fun stuff anymore. I said, well, it's simple to solve your problem. You charge $5,000 a day. He says, well, if I do that, I won't get as much work. I said, yes, but you only need one-fifth as much work to make as much money. And you have more time to do your fun stuff. So he raised his price to $5,000 a day. 
And the next month, he sent me another email. He says, you know, I raised my price to $5,000 a day, and now I have more people asking me to do things for them. He says, they said, because I was charging so much, I must have been really good. So you should be charging for the value of your work, not the cost. Here are some more things to teach in this new model. How do you do distributed development? How do you license your software properly? How do you develop these formal standards I've talked about? And how do you write your software to these standards? How do you motivate other people to help you write your software? How do you locate and engage people who can help you do your work? And how do you innovate all the time, constantly? Because that is what creates value. When you're building a house, you take lumber, transform that lumber into a house. It is that transformation of the lumber into a house that creates the value of the house. This is what people pay for. They pay for a solution. They do not pay for a product. Only if the product gives them a solution do they pay for it. They're paying for the value that you bring them. Here's some other things we should be teaching. We should be teaching the fundamentals. How does a computer actually work? This is what I learned 42 years ago. I learned how the computer actually works. I learned how you build what is known as a flip-flop, and a register, and a CPU, and memory, and cache. I learned how that happens. And 42 years later, my education is still good. But if I had learned a product, my education 42 years later would be worthless. We have to teach students how the computer actually works. And this is why it is not enough just to learn Java. You have to learn an assembly language. You have to learn how the computer works. And then you will have a lifetime of education. We should be teaching people how to evaluate different programs and products. It's OK that you learn how to use Microsoft Office. But you should also learn how to use OpenOffice and KOffice. And you should learn how to evaluate what's the best office package for your use. That is real value. And you should learn how to share your software and how to collaborate on it. But it's more than just the software. It's also the hardware. So up in that corner is something known as the Arduino, a very small computer system which has a lot of software that is open. And people who are software people, for the most part, are learning how to use hardware and build hardware with the Arduino. At the bottom is a computer called the Raspberry Pi. This is a full computer system. It has a USB connector. It has an Ethernet connector. Or that's a USB there. Ethernet connector and a video connector. And it's a complete computer system. And it runs Linux. And the, and the Raspberry Pi only costs 35 US dollars. These systems are allowing people to get the hardware that they can experiment with and create new systems. Creative Commons, as I said before, is a way of licensing digital information. And if you're not familiar with Project Gutenberg, there's over 39,000 free books out there which are available. They're out of copyright. 
and it has the the site has a link to over 100,000 free texts. The information is out there. All you have to do is look for it. Now I'm going to skip to a different topic for a second. In the period of 1994 to 1995, a lot of supercomputer companies were going out of business. Companies like ECL and Cray were going out of business. And two people from NASA realized that by using Linux, they could duplicate what these supercomputers could do. And they created a concept called Beowulf systems, which today we call high-performance computing. These systems use exactly the same kernel as I use in my notebook. No difference whatsoever. But they also use three sets of libraries called Parallel Virtual Machine, Multiple Parallel Interfaces, and OpenMP to do the programming. And you can solve problems on a relatively inexpensive set of computers that normally would take 40 times the cost. We're putting it another way. For the same amount of money as you would buy a regular supercomputer, you could buy one that's 40 times more powerful. So what types of problems can these solve? Types of problems that we have every day. How many of you saw the movie Titanic? Lord of the Rings? All of those movies were rendered on Beowulf systems running Linux. And Lord of the Rings was on a Beowulf system that had 160 processors. Lord of the Rings was on a Beowulf system that had 1,024 processors. And today there are Beowulf systems that have over 10,000 processors working together and running the Linux operating system. Here's something that is of importance to Columbia. Resource prospecting through seismic imaging. I was talking to the president of the oil company here in Columbia the other day at Campus Party. And he is using Beowulf systems to make sure, or to give a better probability, that when they drill an oil well, that they will actually find oil. Because it costs several billion dollars to drill one of those holes. More than that, it ruins the environment. So you don't want to drill a hole and not find any oil. By using computer systems and Linux, they are much more likely to find oil when they do their drilling than when they don't. And this is one way that these systems can be of use to Columbia. Here's an example of the image rendering. This was the Titanic. It looks a little bit fake by today's standards, but you know, 20 years ago, it was pretty good. If you're interested in doing this type of imaging, there's also software called Blender. Blender allows you to make 3D movies and also 3D games. If you're into architecture, you can make 3D architectural models. There was a university in Brazil I saw last week where they made a 3D model of a house and as you executed the model, it was like you were in a wheelchair. And in the wheelchair, you would go through the house and find out that your wheelchair would not go through this door. Or when you were trying to get a drink of water, you would find out that by sitting in the wheelchair, you could not reach the sink or you could not reach the cabinet. So here was a very practical example of teaching architects to make things accessible for people in wheelchairs, accessible for people using crutches by using a 3D model created by Blender. Not only is the software free, the movies they create are free, and even the games are free. Here is an example 
of a Beowulf system made up of cast-off computers. There's 48 computers sitting on the floor with 48 keyboards on top, and this keyboard fell off, with the highly sophisticated networking coming out the back. This was actually creating, a, actually used to solve a problem at Oak Ridge National Labs in the United States. And it was so successful that this eventually grew to be 512 computers in the Beowulf system. But they didn't have to pay for it. You could make the same type of computer from some of the laboratories in your universities and your high schools. You could be teaching your students how to program a supercomputer by using the computers you already have in place. All you have to do is use the right software, Linux and supercomputing libraries. We go from the very large to the very small embedded systems. Again, an operating system that's multi-architecture, multi-user, multitasking, stable and secure. But if you're going to create 100,000 kiosks, you also want it to be free of cost, free of royalty, because you don't want to have to pay for your operating system 100,000 times. Linux is a perfect system for that. And so a challenge for Columbia is to get your smartest computer science students together and have them come up with a proposal for a new product and then get your computer science students together with your electrical engineering students using an open platform and open software, create a product that can be manufactured here in Columbia and exported other places in the world. That will give jobs to people in manufacturing. It will help your balance of payments. It will allow people to see Columbia as a country that makes more than coffee. So today, even the student that has no money can find the college curriculum on the internet. Go to the internet. Go to the, to the college curriculum of MIT. Go to the, look at the college curriculum of Carnegie Mellon, or even your own universities here in Columbia. See the courses that they recommend for you to become a computer science major, a biology major, a finance major. Find out what books they say are needed for each one of those courses. Read the books. Go out onto the internet and find the forums where people are discussing these topics. Ask your questions there. The people will answer back. And this is the same thing that you would be doing at the university. Then, as you get to the end of the information, and also there's special places like Khan Academy, where they have lots and lots of videos about different topics, or actually MIT, Stanford, and Rice are publishing all of their courses on the internet for free. And after you have ex gotten all of this information, you will have the same training as somebody who went to that university. You say, well, Mad Dog, that's fine about the training. It's fine about the knowledge. But when you get finished with the university, you have this piece of paper called a diploma. And that's what you show to your employer. Okay, if you want to be a systems administrator, you can go to some certification group like Linux Professional Institute. And they will give you a test that is very, very low cost. And if you pass the test, you will get a, cert a certificate saying that you're that level of systems administrator. And you could take that certificate to a company to have you employed. 
But if you don't have even that money, what you can do if you want to be a programmer is join an open source project. Find something that you are passionate about and create a portfolio of your own programs that you've written. And that portfolio, that, that listing of those programs, you can take to a prospective employer. This is what I did in 1973. When I graduated from college, I had a list of all of the programs I'd ever worked on and the source code for them. And I would show those to my prospective employers. I'd say, this is a type of programming I do. This is a type of code I write. And they would look at that and they'd say, that's pretty impressive. If what you do is find a free software project to work on, the best way is to first start reading the mailing list, watch what they're talking about, and then go and see if there's some bugs you can fix. And when you create a bug fix, you then submit it to the project. After you've solved a couple of bugs, they start to look at you and say, you know, you're pretty good at doing this. How would you like to join our project as a developer? You do that for a while, and now you have a large group of code which you can show to prospective employers. Your prospective employer can look at the mailing list where you've been discussing things. They can see that you're a calm, sensible, smart person. And they say, that's important to us. How many of you, eventually, you can keep the records of your contributions, and then eventually, you can ask for letters of recommendation from the project leaders and from the other people working on the project. You can take those to your prospective employer. And finally, you should ask them if they would give you these letters of recommendation but remember that you too should give praise to other people. I remember one time I was at Digital and I was a product manager for one of the products. One of the engineers had done a spectacular job on a piece of code. And I wrote an email message to the engineer saying to him what a great job he had done. And I copied all of the other engineers in the engineering group. A few hours later, the engineer showed up in my cubicle. He said, there were tears in his eyes. He said, Mad Dog, in the 20 years I've been working for the company, you're the first person who has ever told me that I did a good job. Remember, the word of praise from a peer is often better than a word of praise from a manager. Finally, Mark Shuttleworth, how many of you know who he is? Mark Shuttleworth is the person who started the Ubuntu Linux project. He's also the person who started a company called Canonical. And Canonical is the business side of the Ubuntu project. Mark Shuttleworth needed people to work on Ubuntu. And because Ubuntu was based upon Debian, Mark Shuttleworth took the entire mailing list of the Debian project, put it on a laptop computer, and took that to Antarctica for six months. And while he was in Antarctica watching the penguins, he was going through the mailing list, and when he came back from it, he said, I want you and you and you to come work with me on creating Ubuntu. He didn't need any employment office. He didn't need any human resources people. Because from the mailing list, he saw who had the good ideas. Who were the people who worked together as a collaborative effort? Who were the people who wrote the good code? He didn't have to know whether they were male or female or black or white. And that's how he started Canonical. 
if you are working with closed source, you don't have the ability to do that. Because if you were a student working at Microsoft for the summer, you would not be able to show your source code for Microsoft products to a prospective employer. So in summary, free and open source culture not only gives you the access and the control of your software, but also gives you the ability to study what other good programmers have written and to learn how to do good software engineering. You do not have to go to university to do it, and you also do not need a degree to get a good job. I do believe, however, that lots of people do benefit from going to a university. If you can afford to do it, I recommend that you think about it. But if you can't afford to do it, there are other alternatives where you can also get a good job. With that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about a project I'm working on called Project Kawa. Project Kawa is a project that started in Brazil and is actually aimed towards Latin America. In Latin America, 83% of the people in Latin America live in a city environment. And they usually live in a very dense environment. And in that environment, the internet is not 500 miles away, often it's only 50 feet away. And if we could bridge that last 50 feet, we could bring the internet to everybody. We can also, bringing the internet to everybody, retrain people who need a job. Maybe people who were trained many years ago and their job has been eliminated. We can train them to new technology if we can bring the internet to them. And so, while I love little children, particularly fried with onions, I really care about educating people so that they can have a decent life, whether they're children or whether they're adults. So the goals of Project Kawa are to literally create millions of new high-tech jobs we estimate between one to two million new high-tech jobs in Brazil and another three to four million new high-tech jobs to the rest of Latin America. We want to make computers easier to use. Now, I believe that it's almost impossible to make computers extremely easy to use, but even my mother and father could send email and surf the web. What they were not good at doing was doing backups or installing new software or getting rid of viruses. They didn't understand that. So we want to provide somebody that will do that work for them so that all they have to do is sit down to the computer and do the thing that they do every day, which is the work that they want to do every day. We want to create more environmentally friendly computing. The people before me were talking about creating a computing system of recycling systems. With Project Kawa, we will extend the life of the computer system and also make it environmentally friendly by reducing the amount of electrical utilization. Our, our desktop computer will only use 10 watts instead of 350 watts. Our desktop computer will have a life of 10 years, not three years. We will also create a gratis Wi-Fi bubble over the entire city, so that any place you go, you'll be able to pull out your wireless device, turn it on, and access the internet at speeds of 300 megabits a second. And we will be able to create a low-cost supercomputing grid so that industry and universities can do research to move forward the economy. But most of all, we'll do all of this 
with private sector funding, so there will be no government money necessary. If you have any questions about Project Kawa, you'll be able to go to www.projectkawa.org, and I, I encourage you to do that. And uh, I have a special, uh, I made a special request to Campus Party earlier this year in uh, honor of Alan Turing and his birthday. I asked that they create a birthday cake for Alan Turing. They've been kind enough to do that. And we have it here. It says, uh, yeah, Alan Turing on it with, I think that's a candle. Yes. And so we'll have pieces of it after the talk for as many people that we have cake that we can serve. And I thank you very much for doing that. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. If you're going to ask a question, we ask that you use a microphone so that uh, Matteo, my translator, can translate it for me and I can understand it. And then uh, we'll do that for a few minutes and then we'll have the cake. So, are there any questions? A question way over there. Does anybody have a microphone for him? Well, you can come up here and I'll give you my microphone. Uh-oh, wait a minute. And give me a second because it just, it just, oh, wait a minute, I just disconnected my thing. Um, bueno, um, what, um, what you're suggesting here is that instead of learning programs, we learn the principles to be able to come up with better solutions of our own to problems. I mean, the principles of what is a machine do instead of learning what the program does. Uh, what I was suggesting is that people, ways of people to learn how to do programming and things without having to spend money on a college education. I don't know that I'm suggesting any change in the way that machines are working with this particular thing, unless you're talking about Project Kawa. No, no, no. Uh, you, were, you were saying that we should learn how, to, how the computer works. What yes. does it make? Instead of uh, learning the, 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 the programs and pay for them or something. Okay. I mean, there's, there's different levels of programming. So, for example, you might program with a language like Java. And Java is a very high-level program, programming language, which does a lot of things for you. It does something known as garbage collection. It does something, it pre-allocates memory for you. It does a lot of things that hides the underneath the, the, the system that lies underneath. However, if you don't understand how that system is actually working, then you may write very bad code in Java. And your code would take a long time to execute. A good example of this is that Java is typically not used in real-time programming. Because just the time that your nuclear power plant would be melting, would be the time that Java would want to do garbage collection. And by the time it got finished doing garbage collection, your nuclear power plant would no longer be there, nor most of the city that your nuclear power plant was in. So you need to understand what the language is doing and how the computer works. Without that knowledge, you will probably write very bad code. Okay? So that's why I'm saying you should learn the basics. You should learn as far down in the computer system as possible. And then when the next language comes along, you'll be able to understand how that works too. Next question. Way over there. Eh, muy buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Sergio Loaiza Sánchez. Yo soy wait, instructor. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. For some reason, I think I turned my thing off. Ok, 
Okay, go ahead. Eh, buenas tardes, mi nombre es Sergio Loaiza Sánchez, yo soy instructor del SENA. Eh, pertenezco a un programa que se llama Tecnoacademia, el cual forma eh, niños de colegios. Estamos hablando de niños de edades entre 10 y 15 años. Allí empezamos a darles bases eh, científicas en diferentes áreas. Yo específicamente eh, dicto, digamos que clases o les doy orientaciones acerca de desarrollo de software. Actualmente estamos eh, desarrollando o estamos ejecutando el curso de diseño de páginas web. Aquí eh, inicialmente empezamos a enseñarles lo que es código HTML, que es el código básico para que ellos construyan sus páginas web. Después pues eh, tenemos que eh, utilizar algún editor gráfico, principalmente utilizamos Dreamweaver, pero tenemos el limitante de las licencias de uso de Dreamweaver, los cuales son limitadas porque solo ciertos equipos eh, tienen Dreamweaver. Para eso entonces utilizamos software libre como Composer y también eh, GIMP para edición de imágenes. Eh, de pronto quiero eh, pedirle alguna recomendación suya para eh, mejorar este trabajo, ya que pues alternadamente yo trato de enseñarles tanto Composer como Dreamweaver, pero trato de que utilicen más el Composer porque inclusive me ha parecido que eh, tiene más facilidad de uso y a ellos se les ha facilitado más. Por ser niños de pronto eh, la capacidad de, de aprendizaje no es tanta como la de un profesional, pero trato de introducirlos más a ese, a ese campo o a ese tipo de, de utilización de software libre. Entonces, ¿qué recomendación me puede dar eh, específicamente para desarrollar un mejor trabajo? Muchas gracias. Well, actually, I think you're doing a good job right now. I think you're doing a good job right now. And unfortunately, my expertise is not in web design. So I don't spend much time looking at the tools for web design. Um, I would suggest that, I mean, when you start off with people and you're trying to teach people, I think one of the most important things is to have them do something where they have success almost immediately. So when I was teaching many years ago, I would start them off with a high level language like basic. And I would say a very simple statement, print space five times three, hit carriage return. And I would come back and say 15. Instant success. When you have instant success, you get excited. If you fail the first hundred times you've done something, it's kind of depressing. So what you want to have done is instant success. So using something that's a high level tool to get them started and to see that by doing something a little bit, they see a lot happen is okay. But then later on, after they've conquered that, then you take them down to show them what's really happening underneath so that as the tools change over time, they understand that it's creating HTML, that it's creating a style sheet, that it's, you know, it's making this communication with this thing called a web server, that there's a delay between the time that your browser talks to the web server. These are things they need to know. So I think you're doing a good job. And unfortunately, my expertise is not in web, in, in web design. I mean, I'm lucky to know what a cascading style sheet is. So I can't really help you. But if you go to places like SourceForge and you go to the web designing area, you'll find a lot of tools out there for it. Qué pena. Lo que de pronto también la sugerencia iría, eh, también quiero introducirlos al software libre. Eh, no solamente. Eh, lo que quiero también con eh, eh, enseñarles eh, herramientas de uso libre o programas de libres, también es introducirlos al software libre. Entonces, como ellos son unos niños y muchas veces son muy distraídos, no captan al, eh, todo lo que uno les, les enseña, entonces, eh, también es eso. ¿Cómo introducirlos al software libre? ¿Sí? A sistemas operativos libres. A uso de herramientas libres. A todas las que ustedes acaban de nombrar. 
Entonces, eh, de pronto también a eso iba la sugerencia. Pero está muy bien, muchísimas gracias. Well, the other thing I can recommend is just to let them work together on their own little projects and make them aware of what's out there as free software. Because they will discover things themselves. They are children and they will go and they will find things that you never knew existed. And they will be talking to each other about them. And that is part of the collaboration of free software that they should be learning in the first place. It, be, it is natural for them to learn this. They want to see how things work. They want to take it apart. And they'll gravitate in that direction if you just let them. <laughs> Down here. Thank you. My question is about um, what you mentioned about uh, getting to know how things work. Mm, in, in, in our common university programs, we learn first um, calculus, um, physics, and some um, computer architecture. But we don't really get many instant results of the, out of that. So maybe it should be the other way, so we can feel motivated to, to get better at getting solutions. Because everyone, after they get instant results, uh, after they have um, advanced in their careers, they forget what they learned about um, low-level programming, for example. My courses, which I took back in university, were um, a lot of the courses like you've had, where they teach you a lot of theory, and you know they didn't teach you exactly how things worked. I had to get a lot of that on my own. Like I said when I started my talk, the professors will tell you quite honestly, we don't have all the time to teach you everything you need to know. That's a subtle hint. And that hint is that here's a laboratory, there's a computer in it, here's a book that talks about it, go do it. And it's up to you to go and do that work and then go back to the professor and say, this is something I don't understand. Or, What's going on here? I believe that every software engineer should at least at one time in their life build a flip-flop circuit out of transistors and put a few of them together to create something which is a register. They should have a course in computer architecture to understand how the computer works. They should learn an assembly language, or maybe two. This is not to say that they'll be coding their entire life in assembly language. In fact, I discourage people from coding in assembly language. It's too prone to having problems and errors. But if you know how the assembly, if you know how the compiler works and how the assembly language would work, then you can make choices in your high-level programming which will make it work faster. I'll give you a concrete example. I was working for a company that a programmer who had no idea how the computer worked had written a program. It was to sort 1,206 32-byte records on a machine that executed about 1 million instructions per second. It took 10 and a half hours to sort those 1,206 records. That's because he did everything possible that he could do wrong in that one program. He used the wrong algorithm. He used the wrong language. He did everything wrong. And so I took and rewrote the program using a better algorithm, keeping as much in the memory of the computer as possible, And the program did exactly the same results in three minutes. I probably could have made it do it in one minute, but 
I didn't want to waste the time of my programming to do it. So this is why it's important. Another friend of mine took two very large arrays and multiplied them together. And when you do that, the, the numbers of the arrays of the first array tend to come out of the cache memory that's tied to the CPU. But in the second array, every single access of the number misses the cache. So you have to load, reload the cache from main memory into the CPU. By inverting the second array, you tend to make all the numbers stay in cache again. And so the multiplication went 40 times faster. Or looking at it the other way, by inverting the array, he did the application in 1 40th of the time he would normally be done. It's because he understood what the computer was doing and how it worked. If he didn't understand that, you just say, oh, the computer's slow. Next question. Yes, sir. Way out there. Eh, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Carlos Andrés. Mi pregunta es, muchos hoy en día, muchas personas mayores manejan Windows, ¿cierto? Eh, ¿Cómo sería más sencillo para esas personas mayores hacer un cambio de sistema operativo en cuanto a la interfaz? Hoy en día, por ejemplo, yo pues trabajo con personas que es complicado manejar Windows, ¿cierto? ¿Cómo haría, o sea, para que esas personas les quedara un poco más sencillo trabajar la interfaz de Linux? ¿Qué me recomendaría usted para que esas personas no les quedara como tan fuerte en ese aspecto de, de cambio de concepto? My mother and father lived in a retirement home for the last 20 years of their life. And it's amazing what old people can do because they're a lot like young people. They have a lot of time on their hands. And what they need are people to share their ideas with other people. So what happened was there was a computer club that was formed in this retirement home and the people in the, re in the computer club, the more advanced users, started to use free software. And then they started talking about it to the other people in the retirement home. And after a while, the entire retirement home was using free software. People want to have somebody that they can talk over ideas with and ask questions with. If you're the only person using free software in the entire retirement home, you don't have that person to ask questions of. But if you form a little group, then they talk with each other, and then they start to use it more and more. Um, there's some nice things about free software. There's a lot of work going on for accessibility. So people who have uh, poor eyesight, or people who have poor hearing, or people who you know, don't have control over their, their movements anymore, can utilize a lot of free software because of the extra work the free software put into accessibility. And you might want to look for accessibility and Linux on the web, search for that, and that could be something which attracts the older people. A lot of older people also don't have very much money. So you point out to them, here's places like Project Gutenberg, where you can get a lot of books for free. And remind them that they can get their software and run on older computer systems for free. They don't have to pay for it. So a lot of times older people might have an older, slower computer system that won't handle Windows Vista or Windows 7 or Windows 8. But it can run Linux very nicely if it's tailored for them so they can use it. And finally, a lot of people, a lot of older people, all they really want to do is surf the web, read some email, 
manage the pictures of their children, things like that, look at some videos that they took, and by formatting a system, a Linux system, to do just those things, it makes it very simple for them to do that. And so you could help to create and tailor a, a Linux system to do those things, and then it makes it a lot easier for them to use so that they don't have to get used to using Windows 8 or Windows 9 or Windows 132 when it comes out. All right, this is going to be the last question because then we're going to have cake. Yes, sir, right there. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es José Ignacio y me llama mucho la atención de que Linux ayuda a promover una cultura de la legalidad y pienso que ese es un aspecto importante. Eh, sin embargo, me gustaría saber si usted ha realizado alguna investigación en las cuales ustedes han podido determinar cuáles serían esas eh, causas o razones por las cuales a, a la gente del común o a algunos profesionales se les hace tan difícil eh, familiarizarse con, con Linux y tal vez eh, tiene algo que ver la, la interfaz en comparación que, que ofrece Windows o si en realidad existen otras razones eh, de mayor peso para que el, las comunidades las utilicen en menor número. Well, first of all, I'd like to get over the idea that fewer people are using Linux. Um, because in reality, Linux is used on most of the supercomputers in the world. If you have an Android phone, in effect, you're using Linux. Linux is used in lots of embedded systems. And Unix, Linux is used on 50% of all the server systems in the world today. So Linux is used by a lot of people. It's just they don't know it. The place that we are still weak is on the desktop. But actually, on the desktop, we're outselling Apple on the desktop. There's more Linux systems being used today or being shipped every day and used and installed every day than there are XOS systems. But Apple has a larger installed base. So we're catching up to them. Today, in the world, there's 1.5 billion desktop computers. But there's 6.3 billion people. That means that 5.8 billion people have not selected their operating system yet. And these people are not people who typically speak the major languages of the world. They're typically not people who do the business the same way that Microsoft does. And so these people are very likely to choose an operating system that is Linux. Why do, not more, why do more people not use it today? It's because when you go to the computer store, you get a computer that's brand new and it has Windows installed. And that's because most computer stores today do not sell computers. They don't sell computers, and they don't sell computer science. What they sell is shelf space. They want to have something sitting on that shelf that somebody comes in and buys and takes home so they can put something else on the shelf. And so the only reason that they're selling Windows is because that's the thing that most people buy when they go to the computer store. It's why a lot of stores don't bother selling Apple things, because they know they're only going to be selling to 9% of the purchasing public. So what we need to do is to get simply more people using Linux so that when the older person in their retirement home or the younger person who's sitting at home, when they have a question, they know that somebody else close by might be able to answer their question. It's inertia. It's like trying to push a big stone and getting it started. But once that stone starts moving, then it's hard to stop it. I remember when 
the IBM PC first came out. Millions of people didn't run out and buy one immediately. It took time to get them used to that model. And so it takes time to get people used to Linux. But we are winning. And we will win. It's inevitable. Thank you very much. Do we have any plates or knives or things for the cake? Ah, we do. Okay. We're going to push this up. Well, maybe we're not going to push this up. <laughs> I think we need to move that up closer to the stage. There we go. And so people can have a piece of Alan Turing cake on a napkin. And we have somebody cut it. I'll be happy to cut the first slice, but then I think I should cut up my, uh, close up my notebook. Okay, here we go. We're going to cut the Alan Turing cake. What is a big cake? How, do you, how should we cut this? Maybe little pieces like this? Or? Why don't we just cut the center out? Okay, we're going to do that. All right. I'm making the first cut of the Alan Turing cake. Happy birthday, Alan Turing. You know, we should sing happy birthday, but it's copyrighted. And then we'll make another slice. That's true. Little old ladies are on the copyright on that. Okay, so I made the first cut here. And we bring it up, bring it up. I don't want to stick my finger in it. Bring it up, flopping it over. Oh, hey! Okay, thank you. I can't eat it because I'm diabetic, so. Okay, Who's, come up, come up, have the first piece of Alan Turing cake. All right, take a picture of him, that's great. There he is, okay. Well, that looks a great, this is, I wish I could eat that, but I'm diabetic, so. Would you please cut the rest of the cake and give it out to people? Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Hola a todos. Quisiera quitarles dos segundos mientras que partimos la torta de Alan Turing. Queremos decirles algo. Estamos, este año nos está acompañando un grupo de personas del Chocó. Es la primera vez que un grupo tan consolidado viene a visitarnos. Y queremos invitarlos a lo siguiente. Tenemos un hashtag, se llama Ideas TIC Chocó. Queremos que todos ustedes nos ayuden a compartir con ellos sus experiencias y sus ideas para que ellos puedan sacar información de la gente de videojuegos, de la gente de ciencia, de la gente de software libre, de la gente de cultura digital y queremos invitar